Welcome back to our annual celebration of National Stuttering Awareness Week. I can't remember ever being as excited about a topic as tonight's focus on the human-animal bond. I feel better just having these donkeys next to me. And no one is better qualified to talk about this topic than our guests tonight. You may have noticed that we have two four-legged friends among us tonight. Little Georgie, the Jack Russell Terrier, and her human connection, Holly Clark. And Polly, the Black Lab, and his partner, Leah Schwartz. They are official pet partners, the wonderful organization that we are partnering with tonight. The benefits of the human-animal bond are being recognized from the Mayo Clinic with 18 therapy dogs to Emory University to literacy programs and schools across the nation. Plus, and it's a big plus, animals aren't judgmental. People are, and kids who stutter know the difference. For many, having the opportunity to talk openly and be listened to, and it doesn't matter how long it takes, may be crucial to making progress in therapy. I'm going to ask Holly and Leah to say just a few words, if they would, about the marvelous work that they do. Holly mentioned that Georgie had a few issues herself. She wouldn't know it, but was ready to move on towards helping others. It sure looks like she overcame them. Holly, tell us a little bit about her. Well, good evening, everybody. And I can tell you, we are delighted to be here. We got in a cab and Georgie's ears went up, and when she gets interested, her ears go out. We call it airplane ears. Um, Georgie, that's correct, Georgie had a few issues. Georgie is a rescue dog. She was found in Staten Island, tied to a post, and left. And somebody had just walked away from this dog. She was put into a shelter, and then the shelters are sweeped, and she was taken home and, and fostered by a wonderful woman. I just lost a dog, I needed a new, companion and there and that's the story of Georgie and myself. Georgie needed a little help. She um, would lunge at other dogs. Some of her behavior wasn't as, as gentle as it could be. But um, I worked with her and with a trainer and then the trainer suggested I take her into uh, the ASPCA for therapy dog training. And we did that last year. And this is what you see. And she's not exactly <laughs> upset by anything. <laughs> George, you lie? No. I just, um, and since that time, we are, we, we are doing a variety of things to make everybody's life interesting, She, uh, including mine. She goes into an Alzheimer's um, facility once a week, and she has her favorites. Mm -hmm. And we go down and help out the students uh, in uh, Cooper Union when their when exam time comes around. It has been found and proven that students' anxiety drops when you put them around a dog. Uh, she also works repeatedly for the ASPCA in the tests for other dogs, and I almost demand that of her because it's also give back time. And now we're doing this. So I, I want her to have a variety of experiences. It keeps, it keeps her interested. It keeps me interested. And it just goes to show you what an animal can do for you, you know? So we're and delighted for an animal. Here. Thank you, Holly. I knew, I knew that you would be more than <laughs> Leah adds that she does all the talking, but Polly gets all the credit, and rightly so. Leah, tell us a little bit about Polly. Good evening, yeah. everybody. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. Um, this is Polly. So, <laughs> <laughs> Polly was um, bred and raised by the Guide Dog Foundation for the Blind. He was given to me at one year old. I was running their puppy raising program in New York City. Um, he was given to me terrified of men, terrified of garbage cans, terrified of his own shadow. Um, they gave him to me to sort of flood him in New York City. So he came to class with me. I was in graduate school at Columbia. He came to Columbia every day. He walked in the graduation ceremony. Um, they gave him a little diploma when I graduated. <laughs> and now, seven years later, he has a fully trained service dog certification because I went on to do service dog training work and he came with me every single day. He's helped numerous people with disabilities. 
Um, we work in the Ronald McDonald House with families whose children are in the hospital. We work in two libraries where kids read to him. We visit in schools, hospitals, um, and his favorite place is to go to a group home for developmentally disabled adults where they're all nonverbal, but he just sits on the couch with them and watches TV for hours, <laughs> and it's a great gig. So thank you for having us, and we look forward to meeting you this evening. So exciting, it's such exciting work. We salute Pet Partners Therapy Dogs, Polly and Georgie, as we do their human connections, Holly and Leah, for reminding us of the comfort and the kindness a trusted therapy pet can bring to us all. We're thrilled by the perspective that our next guest brings to this effort. Animals played a huge role during difficult times in his childhood. From lizards and hamsters he could keep in his bedroom to the caged jaguar that he made a promise to. And you will hear more tonight about how he kept that promise. He is CEO of the world's premier group working to save the big cats across the globe. He has dedicated his life not only surveying the world's last wild places, but also in preserving those habitats where the world's most endangered animals live. I'm excited to introduce a man whom I consider a good friend and a shining example of what excellence can bring to any field. Please join me in welcoming Alan Rabinowitz. Thank you all. I know a lot of you here because this is a very important topic to me and I spent a lot of time on what I would say tonight because it's got to be more than just stories and feelings. It's got to be, it's, it's got to be a look at what the real bond is, what the real relationship is between animals and humans that we, believe it or not, in the 21st century we just haven't still been willing to face. <coughs> Normally, I don't read my talks, but there's so much that I want to convey to you that I will be reading m most of this. The relationship of man to animals has gone through various stages over time. Initially, one of dependence and fear. It moved to domination and use. And it's this latter transition of domination and use of animals and nature in general that, that has colored our beliefs about animal intelligence leading us to incorrect assumptions and holding us back for, from a greater understanding of, of the true nature of animal species. Man's earliest relationship with, with animals was with canines. <laughs> I feel like a king now, but they were usually <laughs> sort of like cheetahs, actually. Man's earliest working relationship was with canines. They were the first domesticated animal. But well, that was when each group learned they could hunt better together than alone. Wolves were the superior tracker, man had better weapons. The crossover to domestication, which was the first, occurred when dogs diverged from wolves 27,000 to 40,000 years ago. Whereas if you think about cattle, cattle only were domesticated about 10,000 years ago. For cats, cats are a different story. Cats domestication was thought to be around 4,000 years ago, although actually there's now good evidence to suggest it was double that, about eight to 9,000 years ago. And there's a lot of really interesting studies about just how domesticated cats truly are, about who <laughs> domesticated whom, <laughs> because there is actually some very good evidence to suggest that cats adopted humans for warmth and food, not the other way around. <laughs> now this is very interesting. You often hear the saying, dogs are man's best friend. That statement was first recorded by Frederick II, King of Prussia in the 18th century, about one of his greyhounds. What's important about that saying, dogs are man's best friend, is the recognition so long ago, over the centuries, that animals are different from humans in some positive and therapeutic ways. Such realizations could have been, could have been, if man was smarter, could have been the, the germ for real insights into animal intelligence and cognition very early on. But it never happened. And it never happened because most of our beliefs about the world 
have been colored historically by religion and by the assumption that every organism was made for the sake of man. From the time of Plato and Aristotle, there developed a widely accepted concept, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, called the great chain of being, a strict religious hierarchical structure of all matter and life that was believed to have been decreed by God. The chain starts from God and progresses downward, eventually getting to animals and then lower trees, stones, and metals. Of the animals, birds were superior to aquatic creatures, and then you descended through reptiles, amphibians, and insects. At the very bottom, we, we find creatures like oysters, clams, and barnacles. It, it, it was all based on the, the idea that those animals closest to man's image were the highest, because man's image was, of course, the image created in the image of God. All animals, from, from the mammals on down, were believed to have limited, believed and still are believed to, have limited intelligence, limited awareness, no ability to use logic and language, and the absence of an immortal soul. Even Thomas Jefferson, considered perhaps our most scientifically minded president, firmly adhered to the great chain of being. The strict hierarchical classifications of the great chain of being were only abandoned, believe it or not, in the early 20th century. But yet, many of the underlying assumptions persist, persist today. Right now, and I would really, I would not go out of my comfort zone thinking that right here in this room, there are those people who assume, because of education, a cognitive ladder from lower to higher forms with human intelligence at the top, whether it's determined by God or it's determined by evolution, we have an assumption of cognition that goes from low to high. This has been perhaps one of the greatest failings of human intelligence and has severely limited our ability to understand the world around us in a realistic way and to understand how other species can heal us and keep us healthy. Okay, so here's an idea. It's not my idea, it's an idea that's finally, in 2016, coming to fruition. What if, what if intelligence and cognition takes different forms that are incomparable to ours, forms for which we have no frame of reference as human beings, forms for which we have no words or way to describe, Okay, do you understand that? Are you dumber than a squirrel because you can't recall the location of, a hun of hundreds of buried acorns? <laughs> Are you less perceptive than a bat because you can't navigate through pitch blackness? Are you physically handicapped because you can't chase down a running antelope? Or are you perhaps mentally challenged because you can't understand the lyrics of a songbird? <clears throat> Finally, Finally, and it's not widespread, we have started to rethink everything we thought we knew or assumed about animal intelligence and emotional capacity. Even the ABMA, even the American Veterinary Medical Association today officially, officially recognizes three things. Number one, they officially recognize the, the, the existence of the human-animal bond. Number two, that the human-animal bond has existed for thousands of years and is important to human health. Number three, that the human-animal bond serves important needs of both humans and animals. At canine research centers, at places like Yale and Barnard, we've now uncovered a vast array of characteristics of the domestic dog, more advanced than their ancestral or wild counterparts. Dogs can read our facial expressions, they can read our eye movements, and there's emotional reciprocity. If you recall, in Homer's Odyssey, if you recall, if any of you have read Homer's Odyssey, <laughs> the, 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 and I'm saying that as if I've read it, which I haven't. The 8th century BC, upon Odysseus's return, his, his, 
His beloved dog, Argos, is the only individual who recognizes him. In fact, research now shows, this is really interesting, research now shows that the communications between us and our pets, mostly dogs is what the research has been done on, often mirrors the mother-infant bonding patterns that forms the whole basis of our social ability, sociability. It's only relatively recently that, that we are accepting the varied nature and abilities of other species even when we don't fully understand it. We know, we know, as spoken before me, that animals provide exceptional therapeutic support to, to individuals with autism, ADHD, substance abuse disorders, PTSD, and stuttering. One study on therapy dogs with, with autistic children, the results of which are very relevant for stutterers, show that they allow the children emotional attachment, a sense of being meaningful and alive, which they don't feel with humans, an opportunity to restructure the social world that supports communication in a way that they don't feel with humans, and the development of the sense of self, imagination, play, empathy, and morality, which they don't get from humans. While most research has been centered on dogs, Many species provide different levels of emotional support, which is why all kinds of animals, snakes, frogs, lizards, birds, pigs, rodents, fish, insects, primates, have all been welcomed into our homes as pets around the globe. Studies have clearly shown that having or caring for a pet has proven health benefits. It lowers blood pressure, it relieves stress, it reduces risk of heart attack, it, it improves sleep, and it provides emotional support. There is evidence that pets help cancer victims, particularly children. But are all pets equal in their benefits? That's been an interesting study. It depends on how you measure it. But the answer to the science has been no. Not all pets are equal if you measure it by certain standards. Dogs, of course, are the best. <laughs> studies show dogs, this is a great one, studies show dogs love their owners five times more than cats do. <laughs> dogs and cats were separated from their owners and their saliva tested for oxytocin, which is called the love hormone. It's the hormone that makes us feel great. Feel, if, you're, if you're in love, if you're happy, you produce oxytocin. That's when human and that's human and animals both. When they feel affection, they produce oxytocin. After the pets, were, dogs and cats, were separated from their owners, then the owners of pets were, were reunited for, for ten minutes playing together, and their oxytocin levels were, were measured. The, the dogs' level shot up five times more than the cats. Level. <laughs> and by that, they're saying dogs love you more than cats do. But anybody who owns dogs and cats would probably know that. <laughs> but all animals provide benefits. In Alzheimer's patients, fish tanks during mealtime, fish tanks during mealtime increased appetite and showed metabolic gains in weight. Pets created significant reduction in, in anxiety for patients with mood and psychotic disorders. Doctors put fish, tank in wait, fish tanks in waiting rooms to ease anxiety. Petting an animal has been shown to ease arthritic inflammation. And it's not just domestic animals whose distinct ability promote a healthier relationship with humans. A lot of you know my story or, or, or have read about it. As a child, in addition to my little pets I had, had at home, hamsters, snakes, uh, turtles, I was drawn mostly to the caged big cats at the Bronx Zoo. They enabled me to experience and to be part of a world outside that of humans. They enabled me to feel not broken. People go into to the garden, the park, the woods, or the deep forest to calm themselves and to heal. Carl Jung, Carl Jung said, you, you can only know yourself if you get into yourself, and you can only do that when you accept the lead of an animal. The human-animal bond 
is a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that's influenced by behaviors that, that are essential to the health and well-being of both. Now let's circle back to, to the complex and often misunderstood phenomenon called stuttering. Physiologically, we know that stuttering can be caused by neurological malfunctions, perhaps related to aberrations in the basal ganglia. We also know now that there's a genetic component to these malfunctions. Recently, Dr. Dennis Drana, a director of the Stuttering Foundation, discovered particular genes related to stuttering. Psychologically, we understand that the manifestation of stuttering and even its control is less straightforward and involves the environment of the stutterer. This is where animals come in. Dogs or pets take you closer to fluency through consistent practice of non-anxious speaking. And I know that for a fact. Pets allow you to create positive memories of normal speech behavior. I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak to adults. They thought I was broken or stupid or retarded, so I stopped speaking. But I knew I could speak because I spoke to animals. And that created feed that, that that allowed me to know I could speak. It's just that for some reason I couldn't speak to the people. Pets don't try to alter your feelings of sadness, inadequacy, in, inadequacy and loneliness. They let it be. I could talk to animals when I couldn't talk to people, I always have said. And I've heard this repeated over and over again by stutterers. They didn't judge me. They didn't correct. They listened. Frankly, I'm continually surprised. Continually. And this is how Jane and I first started this conversation of me even coming to speak because of articles about this. I'm shocked, actually, when I see articles in 2016 of how dogs or other animals have helped children with learning speech disabilities, soldiers with PTSD, people with traumatic injuries, as if this is something new or surprising. We have to better understand how little we have understood the nature of animal cognition and how much we're hurting ourselves and the ones we love by not seeing that clearly. You don't understand it, accept it. The American Medical Association doesn't understand acupuncture, never wanted to accept it, but they accept it because it works. We have to open our minds to what animals do for us in this world, because those who do, those who try it, find immediate gratification. For me personally, Animals gave me a life of unlimited possibilities. When the human world told me I was broken and put me in a box. Animals saved my life. I believe personally, I firmly believe that any clinician, any speech pathologist, anybody who works with stutterers should be opening their space to animals just letting them be there. And that's all I have to say. <laughs>